On the night of November the 12th, 1944, 200 young airmen set off on one of the most daring raids of the Second World War. There's the target. Go and do it. At the time, we just got on and did it. That, that, that was our job. 70 years ago, their target was lurking in a Norwegian fjord deep inside the Arctic Circle. The Allies had already attacked it on 33 separate occasions. We were beginning to think that it really was unsinkable. They told us on board, this is the strongest ship of the world and never can sink. The target was the battleship Tirpitz. Hitler called it the pride of the German Navy. Churchill named it the Beast. And he was willing to risk the RAF's finest units, Nine Squadron and the Dam Busters, to sink it. It never occurred to us we were in danger. The chap either side of us may have been, but we weren't. That day, the dam busters should have been shot out of the sky. We uncover new evidence to help explain one of the luckiest escapes of the war. And perhaps for the final time, key participants in one of the most audacious raids of World War II tell their story. We said to ourselves, well, we've sunk the beast at last. <laughs> Seventy years after the sinking of the battleship Tirpitz, historian Patrick Bishop is exploring the Norwegian fjord that was its final resting place. It looks like, I don't know, maybe uh, one of the ship's plates. You can see some riveting here. So there's still little scattered sort of mementos uh, of Tirpitz lying around here today after all this time. Patrick has come to Norway to find out how the RAF's 9 Squadron and 617 Squadron, the Dam Busters, finally managed to sink the unsinkable battleship. This day is always commemorated as Tirpitz Day by 617 Squadron, but it could be remembered in a very different fashion. It could have been remembered as the day that 617 Squadron was annihilated. It's an enduring mystery. Why was it that they were able to get in there, bomb, and get away with no losses? It could have gone very, very differently. 70 years ago, the Tirpitz was the greatest single maritime threat to the Allies. At 35 miles an hour, it was faster than any British battleship. Its eight 15-inch guns could fire 17 miles beyond the horizon. It could sink you before you even saw it. Its armor was so thick that conventional bombs bounced off it. An impressive giant of a ship, Tirpitz, was built to be as nearly unsinkable as a ship could be. When Hitler launched the Tirpitz on April the 1st, 1939, it was worldwide news. Teenager Tony Iverson was mesmerized by the flickering images. I remember seeing in a the cinema in York, where I lived, and seeing a newsreel of this battleship, this huge thing. I had no idea when I saw this with my girlfriend that uh, one day I might be linked with Tepitz. Tony was part of a generation who grew up with the romance of flying. Every young man in the world wanted to fly. It didn't hurt sometimes on a Saturday night when you'd come back to the local dance when you hoped a girl would say, and what have you been doing today? You could say, oh, well, I've been dicing with death in the heavens. <laughs> Tony, now 94, flew Spitfires in the Battle of Britain. He then joined the elite bomber force, the Dam Busters. In 1943, the Dam Busters 617 Squadron had breached the Ruhr dams using inventor Barnes Wallace's bouncing bomb. The squadron became the RAF's experts in precision bombing. A year after the dam's raid, 
most of the squadron had moved on or had been killed in action. It was time for the next generation of the best young flyers. I was at university and I decided that the Air Force really was the, for me. I made the big mistake of saying that two and two made four. I should have said five. And because I said four, I became a navigator and I was not very pleased at the time because I wanted to be a pilot. I was a student and I was doing um, electrical engineering. I didn't want to go into the army, I didn't want to go into the navy, and I thought the Air Force sounded pretty good, but um, I was always a bit worried about my eyes because they, they weren't as, really as good as they should be. So I just learned the lines that they were, the bottom line or whatever it was that they were being asked, and reeled that off and passed the eye test. Within months of joining the Dambusters, the new crews in their Lancaster bombers would be fighting in one of the most inhospitable environments of the war. After the German occupation of Norway, the Arctic Circle became one of the key battlegrounds of the conflict. In January 1942, Hitler ordered his biggest battleship north to threaten the Arctic convoys delivering essential supplies to the Russians. Churchill promised Stalin that he would maintain this lifeline. Without it, the Soviet war effort would collapse. In June 1942, the largest Arctic convoy of the war, 35 merchant ships, set sail escorted by 43 warships. They were only too well aware that the Tirpitz was poised to pounce. The possibility that it's going to, to put to sea is enough to create what can only be described, I think, as panic. The rumor caused the Admiralty to issue a fatal order. The convoy is to scatter. That means that the escort, this massive escort that they've gathered, is to return home and that these merchant men uh, are basically on their own. This is an extraordinary decision. And of those ships that set out, only 11 actually make it to port. They're sunk not by Tirpitz, but by German submarines and and the Luftwaffe, who have a field day. So without firing a shot, Tirpitz had actually scored an enormous psychological victory against the Allies. This, the biggest Arctic convoy loss of the war, provoked a furious response from Winston Churchill. The destruction of this ship is the greatest event at sea at the present time. No other target is comparable to it. With Royal Navy ships desperately needed in the Far East, the British threw everything at the Tirpitz, including dive bombers, manned torpedoes, and midget submarines. In two years, 31 attempts failed to sink the Phantom Menace. So Churchill called in the Dam Busters to finally finish the job. They would have just two months to sink the unsinkable Tirpitz before the onset of the Arctic winter. If they failed, the British Navy in the North Atlantic would be tied up until the spring. The Dambusters were to be joined by Nine Squadron, one of the most distinguished in the RAF. We were called to a special briefing at Woodhall Spa, at our friend's base, where, um, their wing commander flying, a man called Tate, took us into um, a briefing room which had been totally blacked out. So we knew that it was something special. And he, he was a, a fairly dramatic man. And he enjoyed having us all sit down and then suddenly drawing the, the cloth of a model in front of him which was, of course, the Tirpitz. Gasp from everybody. The beast was hiding at the northern tip of Norway, well out of the range of a direct attack from Britain. So the RAF came up with a daring plan. We um, were told to practice a lot of dinghy drill. Well, dinghy drill was the procedure for getting out of an aeroplane if you had to land it in the sea. 
They were going to attack the ship by the Soviet Union. On September the 11th, the two squadrons took off on an unprecedented 3,400 mile mission. They first flew the 1,100 miles to Russia. Then, after refueling and at the very limit of a Lancaster's range, they flew on to bomb the Tirpitz. In their bomb bays, they were carrying the new Barnes-Wallace designed 12,000 pound tall boy. It was a revolutionary precision weapon. In the right hands, it flew like a dart. Barnes-Wallace has designed it so it didn't tumble over like a bomb might. It was dropped and flew directly onto the point it was aimed at, I hope. <laughs> tall boy was beautifully designed, if you can say that about a bomb. It had fins at the rear, so that when it fell, it went into a spin. That meant it was flying very accurately. The raid would have such propaganda value that a film camera went along to record it. After a six-hour flight from Russia, the Lancasters approached the target. I could see Tirpitz over the front of my Lancaster, and at about the same time, I saw all the smoke generators start up. And they had about 200 plus, so they filled the field very rapidly with, with smoke, because my bomb aimer said, it's no good, Skip, I can't see anything. So we just, we just had a go. Most of the tall boys plunged harmlessly into the smoke screen. But having survived this attack, the Tirpitz was now forced to make a fatal move. In 1944, despite five years of conflict, the crew of the Tirpitz was largely immune to the hardships of the war. Historian Patrick Bishop has come to Tromso's Tirpitz Museum, located in a former German bunker. He's exploring the daily routine on board with curator Leif Arneberg. This is the wallet that is phoned by a diver. Yeah. Thank you, sorry. And oh, wow, have a that. tobacco card. So this is like the, your, your weekly tobacco ration. Ration, yeah? yeah. But under the card, what have we got? Something yeah. different. Ah, my gosh. I think we all know what that is, don't we? Tobacco and condoms. Uh-huh. <laughs> Two staples of the, uh, of the, of the, of the seaman's equipment, I went ashore. That is a cup of, for coffee from the ship, taken out by some of the workers who was cutting the ship after the war. Yeah, so I mean, it's a nice bit of crockery, that, isn't it? Yeah. It looks like they live pretty well. The ship had a crew of 2,400 men. It was so large, it ran its own bakery, cinema and post office. It even produced its own newspaper. Karl Heinz Kersling was 21 years old when he first stepped on board the 42,200 ton Tirpitz. When I did that, I was here. He had me ask my fellow often. He had me fellow often. We, we, we were young and we, we were proud, and, and, and uh, the girls looked for our nice blue uniform, you understand? <laughs> German troops retreated on all fronts, and starving German civilians faced daily attacks on their cities. Life on the Tirpitz remained largely unaffected. We have uh, had uh, good food and uh, clean rooms, clean wash. Three days in the week we have meat, and in the evening we have uh, uh, Sausage and, and, and such things, cheese. Jeden Sonntag gab es Rotweinsuppe. Jeden Sonntag gab es Rotweinsuppe mit Sago. Weiß der Teufel, wo sie den Rotwein alle her hatten, ob sie Frankreich kriegten oder was weiß ich woher. Aber wenn da ein Teller von drin hattest, dann war schon leicht angesäuselt. <lacht> ja, war gut. But in October 1944, as Soviet forces advanced into Norway, the Tirpitz was moved 120 miles south to Tromsø. It was a fatal mistake. The ship was now almost within range of a direct attack. 
the news encouraged Churchill to pile on the pressure. I consider that every effort should be made to attack this ship, even if losses have to be incurred. The RAF went into a frenzy of activity. If the Lancaster bombers were completely stripped of excess weight and filled with extra fuel, they might just reach their target. Our engines were changed and, and armor was taken out, the one behind the pilot's seat was taken out, the big piece of armor plating. They had to reduce the weight, so they took out the mid-upper turret in its entirety, they took the guns out of the front turret and reduced the amount of ammunition in the rear turret. Losing weight increased range, but the Lancasters needed to carry much more 100 octane aviation fuel to get them to Tromso. The extra fuel tanks was a Wellington tank of uh, 200 gallons and a Mosquito tank of uh, 50 gallons, one on top of the other, placed inside the fuselage where the rest bed would have been. And it was so dangerous that the ground crew had to wear plimsolls because of the danger of a spark if they wore their boots, and that would probably blow up the whole aircraft, at least one, perhaps several more around it as well. I have to say that despite all the fuel joints being thoroughly tight and there no sign of any leakage, you still could smell that 100 octane. Um, so it, it made you feel a little bit sick, I suppose. On October the 29th, 1944, the refitted Lancasters of 617 and 9 squadrons took off on a 13-hour non-stop mission. To succeed, the undefended planes needed to take the Tirpitz by surprise. They crossed the Norwegian coast where they knew there was a gap in enemy radar and they used neutral Sweden to disguise their approach. Everything was in place to finally send the Tirpitz to the bottom of the sea. But the one thing not in their control was the weather. Just 30 seconds before bombing commenced, Tirpitz was covered by a blanket of low cloud. But most people didn't bomb because they couldn't see the Tirpitz. It's very disappointing, all that preparation and all that hard work and all that flying and to arrive together at the right time over the right point and then to be wasted is, I won't say disheartening, because we weren't disheartened, we were annoyed, perhaps. But after the failure of this raid, there was to be no let-up. The crews were ordered back again. There was no time to plan a new route, and there was one more shock in store for them. They said, uh... Sorry to tell you, chaps, but uh, since the last trip, the, the Germans have moved two squadrons of fighters uh, to be near the Tirpitz at Bardafoss in Norway. Um, well, this made us swallow a little bit. We were a little apprehensive because, of course, we hadn't got the mid upper turret, but. Like good little boys, we all went off. But new evidence has emerged that suggests the Dambusters and Nine Squadron were in even greater danger than they ever imagined. In November 1944, the RAF was preparing to attack the battleship Tirpitz for the third time in two months. The British were still hoping to take the Nazis by surprise, even though they'd be flying the same route. But new evidence suggests the Germans may have been expecting them. On the Norwegian island of Andoya, historian Patrick Bishop is investigating a story that the Germans repositioned some of their radar before the third raid. Patrick has come to the site of a Wasserman radar installation the most powerful German radar of the conflict. He's with local resident, John Ronald Norheim, who has brought along a photograph his father took at the end of the war. 
Hitler had this obsession with the idea that there were the Allies, even though they were sure mm. Normandy yep. landings had gone ahead, he still clung to this belief that there'd be an Allied landing in Norway as well. That was I was I was told that yeah. this radar was picking up all the uh, the ship traffic going yeah. towards Russia. Now, if we look at the, this picture here, we've got this landmark, mm. which yeah. is this very prominent uh, rocky island just behind us, and you can see with that in the bottom right-hand corner yeah. of the picture. Mm. Um, this box structure that's on the back of the scaffolding, if you like, is actually the rear uh, of, yeah. of the radar set. Yeah. So that would mean that the, 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 the thing is actually, the Wasserman is pointing inland, it's not pointing out to see where you might expect it to be. Yeah. This is very interesting, because it was possible for the Wasserman radar to actually pick up the, the raid as it yeah. came in, as it homed in on yeah. Tromso to bomb the mm. turpets. Mm. With the radar repositioned to track the flyers coming from inland, all it needed was one phone call to the fighter squadron at Bardafoss. In just 13 minutes, the fighters would be swarming around the Tirpitz, ready to shoot the Lancasters out of the sky. One of those crack fighter pilots at Bardafoss now lives halfway around the world in Southern California. Kurt Schultz, age 92, meets with a group of veteran flyers every week. 70 years ago, he wouldn't have hesitated to shoot them down. It's a friendship that has developed, and I'm so grateful for that because I was the enemy. Kurt started the war as a navigator on bombing raids over England. But later he became a fighter pilot. He was posted to a squadron of fighter aces based deep inside the Arctic Circle. He wasn't prepared for their relaxed attitude to discipline. I arrived just a few days after they had tried to kill Hitler. And you know, the, the, the salute was like that. All of a sudden, they all walked in. And instead of greeting like that, they greeted like that. And, you know, I thought, she can't, what happened to you? So, but it was a very loose bunch as far as real discipline was concerned, but they were very, very successful. Kurt flew 63 missions and had three confirmed kills. Some of his colleagues at Bardafoss were among the highest scoring aces of the war. Major Erler, he had... Uh, 199 victories, and uh, I think uh, Captain Durr, who was a group commander, had maybe 160. Joker North had un around 100. These three together had 600 victories almost. As the Lancasters took off in the early hours of November the 12th from the frozen coastline of northern Scotland, the fighters at Bardafoss were preying on their minds. This would be their last chance to sink the Tirpitz before the onset of the Arctic winter. It was cold, but when you're 20, 21, you know, you don't feel the cold the same, but it was cold. If we wanted to have a pee, some kind of waff in the mess at Lossy had provided milk bottles, and of course, there was this odd joke about those. Looking back, they just pitched us into it, as it were. There's the target, you've got the weapon, go and, go and do it. Um, at the time, we just got on and did it. That, that was our job. It was a long, long journey. There was no uh, radio contact, of course. The only way we could navigate, uh, I could navigate anyhow, was take the odd shot of whichever star was appropriate and just keep my fingers crossed. At 7 a.m., the bombers turned east through what they still believed was a radar gap. But German records show they had already been spotted. Defenseless, laden with fuel, and with two and a half tons of high explosives inside their tall boy bombs, they were extremely vulnerable. We had found we were flying into a, a gin clear sky, uh, which, uh, which was perfect for our job, absolutely. But then a little thought came, well, it, it's pretty, it'll suit the fighters pretty well, too. At 
At 7.40, the Lancasters began their run into the target from neutral Sweden. The Tirpitz was already receiving information of confused sightings, some placing bombers on a course to Russia, others placing them 100 kilometers to the north. No one alerted the Bardafoss Air Base. Then at 8.09, the Tirpitz on its own radar spotted the bomber force just 30 minutes away, and it was coming straight at them. The alarm finally sounded at the Bardafoss fighter base at 8.18. This was more than an hour after the raiders had first been spotted. Six minutes later, the Lancasters passed a few miles to the east of Bardafoss on their way north. Mine thought was, hope to Christ the fighters don't get near us. If I got a 109 up my backside, and there would be very little left when he'd finished with us with his cannon. At 8.30, Kurt Schultz arrived at his Messerschmitt 109 fighter. Had he taken off then, he could still have caught the Lancasters. But Kurt and his colleagues lost vital minutes getting off the ground. For a start, the planes were at the wrong end of the runway. And then at the moment they were ready to take off, Air traffic control allowed a transport plane to land. So they let this U-52 that was coming fly in and land down the hill. And uh, so there was another five minutes lost. Just before 8.30 a.m., the Lancasters began their approach to the Tirpitz. RAF cameras were again on hand to film it all. So far, there was still no sign of Kurt and his fighters. It was a Sunday, yes. I was, was standing uh, on the deck. Then came the alarm, and uh, we saw the machine in south. As the Lancasters approached, they were confronted by the first of Tirpitz's formidable weaponry. The ship trained its massive 15-inch guns onto the raiders. Each shell weighed more than a tonne. The Tirpitz guns had a range of 17 miles. Even the big heavy guns could be elevated to reach aircraft. It was a great unfolding orange cloud. This 15-inch shell went off, would have probably <laughs> taking two Lancasters out of the sky together. You could actually see these shells coming up. They seemed to come up so slowly. It was a fascinating sight. You'd never see anything like it again. Within a minute, the rest of Tirpitz's defences opened up on the advancing bombers. My combat station was uh, the anti-air gun. You have to take your hat off to the German gunners. They'd got the altitude absolutely cock on. I mean, we were 15,200 feet, and the flak was bursting exactly at that level. But we were fortunate that they were a little bit early. <laughs> the, the flak was in front of us by a matter of a few yards. When the fuel in a 200-gallon tank is used up, that's when it becomes dangerous, because uh, should a bit of flat get through, it, it's going to hit sort of vaporised uh, fuel. How do you feel? You, I must admit, you, you're a bit excited and think, Christ, uh, uh, you know, I hope they don't hit us. I had to get that aeroplane positioned, so the bomb went down to hit this target, which from 15,000 feet must have looked to my bomb ever like a dinky toy, even though it was 900 feet long. The first tall boy was released at 8.41. It scored a direct hit. The next five recorded another direct hit, three near misses and a stray. Yeah, you could see it go down like a dart almost. <laughs> because it was painted bright green, yeah. You, and uh, 
It looked quite nice, actually, diving down there. It went through the speed of sound. So what these poor sailors f uh, felt when th two, one or two of them landed... When the machine come, are coming against you, you have... you cannot get air enough. It, it's so as um, one pressed your, your, your uh, air... After the first wave of six bombers, Tony Iverson was in the second wave of three. He attacked at 8.42. I bombed at number seven or number eight, and I think I had a near miss or a not so near miss. I, I'm not sure, I've never, I can't go further than that. This second wave scored two very near misses. The bombs were beginning to overwhelm the ship. The first bomb had landed midships. It led to one of the magazines blowing up. Bomb four had hit close to a turret and blew it into the air. Bombs five, seven, nine, and 14 had landed close by. These also had a devastating effect, producing shock waves that buckled the ship's frame and caused it to start to capsize. The first Nine aircraft bombed in one and a half minutes. That's 90 seconds. You can count 90 seconds. Just think of nine five-ton bombs coming down at you. Nine squadron followed up, dropping their tall boys into the smoke. As they exploded, few were certain of the outcome. There was smoke up at the one end. I suppose it would have been... The the pointed band, I think. But the rear gunner was quite convinced. Bloody things going over, Skip. As the Lancasters turned away from the target, they knew the danger wasn't over yet. We realised we hadn't seen any fighters, which is amazing, amazing luck. They were luckier than they could have imagined. The first German fighters were less than three minutes away as the last bomb was dropped. It took me approximately 10 minutes to get to Tromsø from Badefoss. And uh, when I arrived there, the turbots was already turning over. So I turned around and flew back. There was nothing I could do. Kurt had only just missed the defenseless Lancasters. All the crews returned home safely. Was it luck, or were there other forces at work? The sinking of the battleship Tirpitz, after 33 failed attempts, was a remarkable feat of navigation, flying, and precision bombing. But it had a terrible human cost. 1,700 sailors were on board as the ship began to capsize. I, I saw not the explosion from the hit on the ship, but I feel the quake. Uh, you, have, you, you are feeling that the ship make a jump from a, a half meter. And in the next moment, the ship began to capsize. It goes so and so, and, so and, and at last we hanging in the railing here. And I go a moment later into the water, yes. And then I swim to the coastline. And the water was oil. And uh, many of the swimmers lay, have their face in the water. They were died. And uh, it, it looked. I see it. It was crazy. It 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 looks as as when footballs were swimming in the in the water. A, a crazy sight. Willibald Völsing was below decks when the ship capsized. Er stand man plötzlich auf der Decke. Die Decke war 135 Grad gedreht. Das Schiff. Und da stand man auf der Decke. Das war ein komisches Gefühl. Ne? Da ging aber sofort die Notbeleuchtung ein. Die, für solche 
Gelegenheiten gebraucht oder gehe automatisch ein, aber hatte nur eine begrenzte Leuchtdauer, vier Stunden. Da hat man nachher im Dunkeln gesessen. 21-year-old Karl Heinz Kersling was lucky enough to be on shore at the time of the attack. He rushed to the rescue of the hundreds of sailors trapped inside the hull. We sind dann hochgeklettert und unter Anleitung Kapitän und an Sommer und dann äh, haben wir Farbe und Pinsel gehabt und haben die Stellen, wo geklopft wurde, angezeichnet. Damit wir wussten, da sind welche drin. Aber mit unseren Brennern konnten wir nicht kaum was ausrichten. Das waren äh, handelsübliche Handwerker, Brenner. Aber wie denn die Neumark kam, die haben ja die großen Brenngeräte gehabt, dann war das los. Dann ging das los. As the tide rose, the compartments began to fill with water. The rescuers could hear their entombed comrades singing Deutschland über alles until the voices fell silent. Zehn Stunden. Und gerettet hat uns der Kapitän und dann im Sommer, Walter Sommer. Der hat uns herausgezogen. Wir haben geklopft von innen, an die Bordwand geklopft. Vor allen Dingen haben wir mit einem gesprochen, Sigi Stracke. Die waren mit 20 Mann da drin. Und äh, der sagt, holt uns hier raus, wir äh, sind am Absaufen. Und wie die Flut an den Höchststand erreicht war, waren sie weg, waren sie tot. Nine hundred and seventy-one sailors lost their lives, but the beast had been slain. I mean, looking back, it's quite remarkable that the raiders managed to get away with it. Uh, when you think about it, it's the defenders who've actually got the odds stacked in their favour. You've got the squadron of, uh, of crack fighters based nearby, apparently with the specific job of looking after the turpits. You've got the radar systems apparently pointing inwards, yet there we are at the end of that morning, the turpits is sunk, and the attackers have got away with it virtually scot-free. Now, maybe it was just sheer good luck, but I've often thought that perhaps there's another explanation for what happened. On the island of Andoya, Patrick is following a new lead that might explain why the German fighters weren't scrambled in time. He's meeting local resident, journalist Sander Pettersen. As a 17-year-old boy, schoolboy Sander worked in the Endoya radar base for a German officer, Lieutenant Karl Heinrich Vesner. Vesner was a key link in the radar communication network on the island. Pettersen thinks Vesner could have delayed vital information to the fighter squadron at Bardufoss. We understand that Vesner had sympathy for England. How did he let you know that, that he was in sympathy yeah. with Germany's enemies? He speak very good uh, Norwegian. Uh, he said to us uh, in Norwegian, boys, for me, he showed us at silver, it's you. That's like a, a cigarette case or yeah, something Yeah, nice, like very nice. Or oh, inside the, the, Angus, the, the Union, Jack. The inside. Union Jack was inside the, inside was inside the lid yeah, of the... Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Vesner was in the right place at the right time, but was he responsible for delaying vital information about the raid? I think Vesner has a finger to stop sending up a Germany plane to take the Lancaster. Yes. You, but, you, you uh, may be right and that, that, that Vesna, as yeah. you say, had a hand in the affair. Yes, yes, uh, I, uh, no doubt, no doubt. 
To help support Sander Pettersson's story, Patrick has been looking for more evidence. He's uncovered a letter in the Norwegian archives written by Vesna just after the war. This really confirms uh, this man's anti-Nazi credentials. Now, according to him, he actually was actively working against his own people as early as 1944. It's not just him. He's got at least three other colleagues who were in this conspiracy, if you like, with him. The Germans had a, a sabotage plan which they were going to put in place if there was indeed an Allied landing. And they've got a, quite an elaborate plan here for shooting their own officers and running up the white flag. Uh, he goes over to the underground, the Norwegian uh, resistance, and they smuggle him out. Now, if he, his credentials weren't pucker, uh, I can't imagine they would, uh, they would do that willingly. So. Uh, he does actually match up uh, to the description that we're given of him by Sander. So this new information opens the prospect uh, of an intriguing new theory that a good German did intervene uh, in a major operation of war on the side of the Allies and had a material effect on the outcome. On hearing the news that the beast had finally been slain, Churchill wrote to Stalin, RAF bombers have sunk the Tirpitz. Let us rejoice together. For the young airmen of 9 and 617 squadrons, there was relief that they had finally finished the job. We really didn't know we'd sunk it until we got back to near base and they wired us. They, they sent out a signal to say it had been destroyed. Yeah, it was felt, felt marvellous, really. Yeah. I, I mean, it was called um, Churchill's Beast, wasn't it? And uh, I know we, we said to ourselves, well, we've sunk the beast at last. It's quite an interesting experience to, to talk to you about something that happened very nearly 70 years ago. And I'm just getting little flashes of memories. I'm getting a little flash of memory about the mess. Beer flowing freely, wing commander in the middle of it, drunk as a newt, and a great deal of laughter and shouting and chattering. Yes, absolute celebration. We've been three times for the damn thing. We were beginning to think that it really was unsinkable. Frank Tilly and Basil Fish celebrated their weekend leave with a trip to the London Palladium to see comedian Tommy Trinder. I remember Tommy Trinder making a joke about the Tirpitz and so we sat there feeling quite pleased with ourselves, old Basil and I. <laughs> 70 years ago, Kurt Schultz nearly shot down Tony Iverson in the skies of northern Norway. Today, the former enemies are firm friends. Hello. Good morning, Tony. Hello. I am so glad I can talk with you again just one week after your 94th birthday. I like Kurt. Uh, we got to know each other quite well, and we have seen each other on my trips through California. Tony was not too enthused about meeting a damn German uh, uh, pilot. We were a bit wary of each other uh, for, for quite a while. Uh, but then, well, we had a drink and uh, things loosened up. It was a cool reception, but we started talking and we became friends. We never talked about the war. We talked about all kinds of other things that were interesting to us. Talk with you again soon, Tony. Right. Goodbye. Goodbye. There we are. He sounds not too strong. It's a situation where we as human beings finally come through after the politicians did with us whatever they wanted to do. And we said, yes, sir. 70 years on, the raid that finally sank the Tirpitz is still considered one of the outstanding achievements of aerial warfare. I think it was very well planned, very well executed. And uh, 
to throw those big bombs in this close circle around and on the ship was an accomplishment. Yeah. But so a thousand Germans died, so that's something we have to consider too. <sighs> Crazy. Crazy war for nothing. Eight years of my life. That gets us to me now. It was pretty tough once, but now it's all gone. It's rather, rather like the words at the ceremony, at the cenotaph, isn't it? You know, they shall not grow old. It uh, sticks in your throat a bit. Uh, I think all war is dreadful. I do, really. I mean, but if it came again, we'd have to do the same again. You couldn't have the Nazis in charge, could you? No way.